Hi, I'm Jacob Hornberger, president of the Future of Freedom Foundation. This is this week's issue of The Libertarian Angle, the show here on the internet that is brought to you weekly that brings you the uncompromising perspective uh, from a libertarian perspective on what's going on in the world. And I'm joined as I am every week by my co-host, Richard Ebeling, who teaches economics at the Citadel. Richard, welcome back for another week of Libertarian Angle. Hey, it's great to be back on with our viewers and listeners. And you too. <laughs> oh, thank you. I'm glad you added That's the first time I think you've added that. Uh, A weak moment. I didn't mean it. <laughs> uh, Richard, you live in Charleston, South Carolina. You teach there at the Citadel. And we're here to invite all of our viewers, our listeners, um, in fact, everyone, uh, to Charleston, South Carolina. We are coming to Charleston, the Future of Freedom Foundation, uh, the Ron Paul Institute. We are working together uh, to bring what we consider is a very timely, a very critically important conference to the Charleston area. If you've never been to Charleston, this is your opportunity. It, it is one of the most beautiful cities in the United States, and I'm sure Richard will be able to attest to that. We're going to have a conference on foreign policy. Uh, as those of you who have been subscribing to FFF for a long time, certainly from our beginning, we have always stood for a non-interventionist foreign policy. And that's exactly what the Ron Paul Institute's all about. So we have decided to work together to put together a four-speaker conference on Sunday, April 29th from 1 to 5 p.m. So you can fly into Charleston on Friday. You can uh, tour the city. You can ride the, the horse-led uh, carriages. Uh, you can see the old mansions. And then Sunday afternoon, we've got a real humdinger of a conference for you. Four speakers. Um, Richard is, is one of them. Uh, Ron Paul and Dan McAdams, who runs the Ron Paul Institute, and myself. And the theme of the conference is going to be non-intervention, America's original foreign policy. Uh, it's, it's a critically important theme. That's why we spend so much time on it here at the Future of Freedom Foundation. And ideas have consequences. And so we invite you to come to this and, and to let your friends know if you, if you have friends in the Charleston area or even outside the Charleston area. Let them know. April 29th, 1 to 5 p.m. Uh, Richard, I'm excited about the thing. What do you think? I'm really looking forward to this. I think this is a great opportunity for anyone who can find the time to get down here or perhaps just leave, live close by uh, and, and come here for at least even the Sunday if they can't afford to be away for the entire weekend. It is, as uh, Jacob was saying, an absolutely beautiful city. It is historically rich. Uh, you go through the old part of Charleston, walking down cobbled uh, streets, and the plaques say this home was built in 1694, 1723, with little bits of its history. Uh, a building that has a plaque saying that after his inauguration as the first president, George Washington stayed here for all his time in Charleston. And it, it has other cultural aspects as well. Uh, it would, This city was the inspiration for the famous Gershwin musical Porgy and Bess. And you can do a walking tour to, in fact, the places that inspired him and, and, and were part of the play uh, that, 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 that are still around and one can see today. Uh, it is a charming city uh, it, that has a, a colonial history, obviously a tragic Civil War history as well, and is now one of, one of the, the major uh, uh, metropolitan growing areas in the United States. Uh, restaurants, theater, uh, musicals, uh, many forms of entertainment, and beautiful beaches. So uh, uh, if you'd like to attend our conference and want to have sort of a little mini vacation excuse to do so over a weekend, uh, this is the chance. And besides the importance of the theme that we're going to be discussing, um, the world has always been and continues to be a dangerous place. And uh, part of that danger and problem uh, comes from the fact that the United States government, under many administrations now, uh, since the end of the Second World War in particular, have chosen to put the United States in harm's way uh, when it is not involved in any reasonable sense of the national security or the safety of the citizenry of the United States. We have chosen to try to be policemen of the world, the gendarme of the globe, with the consequence that many Americans have been sent off to foreign shores 
uh, to die or risk their lives in hot wars and cold wars and in drone wars uh, with devastating consequences, not just for the Americans who lose their lives or come back permanently injured, but for all the innocent people in the lands that we've chosen to intervene. We should not forget that our actions affect not only the United States, but others around the world who become the innocent victims of American um, sort of, if you will, social global planning and nation building. And these are some of the themes that we're going to be addressing and trying to focus on, uh, and not in an hysterical way or an emotional way, though of course passion is important when you believe in liberty and wish to limit government. But for, for the attendees to hear the message of why America has followed this wrong path, uh, what forms it has taken, the negative and, and tragic consequences it has had, and how at the end of the day it has been a major engine uh, for the growth and the intrusiveness of government in many facets of our life, particularly with this idea of, of government in the name of national security intruding into, surveillancing, and basically finding out everything they want to know about you under the presumption that somewhere, someplace, sometime, there might be a bad person, as they've defined bad person, who they want to interdict. So if you'd like to have an opportunity to hear some of these ideas and interact with people of like-mindedness and to enjoy a delightful city, uh, I really recommend that you join us on Sunday, April 29th, between 1 and 5 p.m. Uh, at the Mills Hotel, right in the center of Charleston. And just have a good time. Yeah, you've actually been to the Mills Hotel, right, Richard? It's a nice place, yes, right? Absolutely. Uh, for a, a meal, for uh, the facilities, uh, such as an event that we're putting on. And uh, it's right in the center of Charleston, uh, the major shopping streets, right near these historical areas of downtown. Uh, no better place to spend a wonderful day. Yeah, I've been to Charleston, and, and I can honestly say if this is not the most beautiful city in the country, it certainly ranks in the top three. I mean, it is absolutely awesome. And we're going to be there at a fantastic time of year, April 29th. Uh, spring will be busting out all over. I mean, if you've ever wanted a, an excuse to go to Charleston, South Carolina, this is it. Because uh, you can you can fly in on Friday. You can spend uh, Saturday, Sunday morning visiting the city and then coming to this conference. And you know, before I get into the substance, Richard, I, I want to highlight, you know, who our, our big speaker here is, Ron Paul. Uh, yes. I mean, this this is people's opportunity to to meet Ron if you've never met him. I, I, I consider Ron one of the real heroes of the libertarian movement. Uh, he was a former congressman. He served in, in Congress for a long time, and, and really he was the only voice there for non-interventionism, <clears throat> along with other things, you know, <clears throat> like, <clears throat> excuse me, ending the Fed and and Austrian economics, and just the whole principles of liberty, the anti-drug war. And I mean, Ron's career has been absolutely heroic. He's certainly one of my heroes. I, I went up on a personal level and campaigned for him in New Hampshire, and I gave some speeches for him when he was running for president. And so the fact that we have him as part of the this speaking uh, group is, to me, absolutely awesome. And you know, I don't think there's very many speakers as passionate and eloquent and knowledgeable in the libertarian movement than Ron Paul. So, so this is exciting that, that Ron's going to be, uh, you know, headlining the, the list of speakers. But, you know, Richard, it's, it's an honor to have you here, too. I mean, you've been, you've been in this movement for, gosh, ever since you were a teenager— you were president of the uh, Foundation for Economic Education. You served as vice president of academic affairs here for FFF for, I don't know, 15 years or so before you went to FEE. You're now teaching at one of the most prestigious colleges in the country. You're the BBNT Distinguished Professor in Ethics and Free Enterprise Leadership at the Citadel. Um, and you and I edited a book on the failure of America's foreign wars uh, since the very beginning of FFF when you were writing a, month, a monthly article for us. We have taken this principal stand in, uh, against foreign interventionism. And so, uh, and, you know, I'm excited to have you speaking in here. You, you, you've given some of the greatest talks uh, in the last 28 years on foreign policy, and so it's going to be great to have you. And then Dan McAdams, I mean, I've heard Dan speak at the Ron Paul conferences uh, here in D.C. I've spoken at two of them, and 
Dan's a fantastic speaker, very principled um, and eloquent exponent of the philosophy of non-interventionism. And uh, I'm excited to be here. I mean, this is, this is what we stand for at, at FFF. Um, look, I mean, we've had two visions in this country, two opposite conflicting visions. One is the original founding vision of the United States, non-interventionism. Uh, it was encapsulated in John Quincy Adams' famous speech, In Search of Monsters to Destroy. He delivered that speech on, on the 4th of July, 1821, I believe it was. And the theme is, is, was really just encapsulated what the foreign policy of the United States was, the founding foreign policy. That, okay, there's a lot of bad things that happen in the world. We can call them monsters, whether they're, they're you know, tyrants or dictatorships or communism or famines or wars or civil wars, a lot of bad things. But the United States is not going to go abroad in search of these monsters. It's not going to go and destroy these monsters. Uh, instead, it's going to have you know, a, a policy of us trying to establish a free society. Now, we know there were big exceptions, tragic exceptions to this principle. Slavery, tariffs, protective tariffs, and the like. But the, the basic idea was that we're not going to send troops abroad. Now here, it was also, the flip side of this was really interesting, is that they said we're going to have open immigration. That if you're, if you're suffering tyranny or oppression, and you want to get out and you can get out, know that there will always be, always be a country that will not force you back. That this will be your sanctuary. So it's a fascinating, unique foreign policy. Uh, that no, no going abroad in search of monsters to destroy, and certain, here's a sanctuary for people suffering from these monsters overseas. We have a completely different system. Americans abandoned that system in the later years in the 20th century, where they said, oh, well, now we're going to go abroad in search of monsters to destroy. We're going to invade Iraq to, to bring freedom to the Iraqi people from dictatorship. Uh, we're going to invade Afghanistan to, to have regime change there and establish a free and harmonious society. Um, and, and you see this throughout the 20s, beginning with the Spanish-American War in 1898, when the U.S. replaced the Spanish Empire and, and took control over Cuba and the Philippines and killed you know, tens of thousands of people in the process. So we have this long legacy now of interventionism. Look at the results. I mean, we live under this, this perpetual war on terrorism. We see terrorist attacks constantly. We see out-of-control federal spending and debt. Uh, we see vi huge violations of civil liberties. We see a government that's assassinating people and now has a formal policy of assassination. Did you, I mean, did you ever think you'd see the U.S. government have a formal policy of assassination? I mean, we often think in terms of totalitarian communist regimes that have formal policies of assassination and torture and, and surveillance, the NSA, and, and then all of the things that have come with the CIA, you know, MKUltra, drug experiments, assassination of political leaders. Uh, I mean, the list goes on and on. So you have two conflicting visions. Which vision do we want for America going forward? That's the theme of this conference. That's what we're going to be talking about. That when, when things are appear dysfunctional in society, it's time to return to founding principles. And that's the founding principle that we're going to be examining in this conference. Yes, and I think we need to keep in mind that, that this, this is a continuity of policy since the end of the Second World War, regardless of whether it has been Democrats or Republicans. It is true that a Republican president or a Democratic president uh, might have chosen a different emphasis, a different tact, a different rationale, a different direction for it. But the fact is that since 1945, America has played and has taken upon itself the mantle of policemen of the world uh, to, to fight first, you know, a cold war against communism, uh, fighting two hot wars, which cost over 100,000 American lives when you combine the Korean War with the Vietnam War. Now thousands more in these post-Cold War uh, uh, third world adventures that the United States has taken on in Afghanistan, as you said, in Iraq. Uh, we, 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 we subsidize both financially and in terms of military equipment, the, the, the violent interventions and the collateral causing of deaths of others, such as our ally, Saudi Arabia, in its proxy war that is fighting in the Arabian country of Yemen, in which thousands of innocents have been 
innocent people have been killed in Saudi bombing with our military uh, hardware and the use of our drones. Uh, and this has continued now with Trump. It's not a matter of saying, well, you know, that there, there, there was Obama and then Bush, but, but well, Trump said America first. The fact is, is that in his first year as president, that is 2017, Trump increased intensively the amount of U.S. drone attacks, including causing civilian deaths in Somalia. He's increased drone attacks in Yemen. He has increased the amount of boots on the ground in Syria and now says that they may have to stay there for an indefinite period of time. So for all the things that, well, you know, Trump will be different. He is merely the same variation. He's just a variation on the same theme where he just wants to do these things in different ways. Just just think of his brinksmanship in Korea. Uh, he has been threatening. Uh, and maybe he just thought it was a bargaining position. Uh, that's how his mind maybe works. But he has threatened nuclear war in, 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 in northeastern Asia. That is affecting both Korea's, Japan, part of China, uh, other countries such as uh, Taiwan and, and, and uh, the Philippines. A nuclear war results in radiation filling the air and the, the, the winds take it everywhere, not only over the, the lands of the bad people, but those who are supposedly the good people who are allies as well, as well as the risk to the, what, over 30,000 American lives of the personnel, U.S. personnel who are stationed in South Korea. Th th this is the mentality uh, that, that, that is being followed by the current administration as a variation on the same thing that has guided both admi all administrations since the end of the Second World War. And at some point, uh, this will result in another tragedy, either a local tragedy or a global tragedy. And we have to rethink, why is America doing this? What is the presumption, the rationale, the, 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 the premise? And is this the, the basis for a free and independent the United States? Or are we to be slaves to this idea of a mantle of responsibility to try to remold and plan the world in the vision of, of various uh, central planning elites uh, in Washington, D.C. The elites vary. Well, the Democrats would like to do this. The Republicans would like to do that. Trump thinks this is how it should be undertaken instead of an Obama. But the mindset is the same. The social central planner trying to remake the world to fit his conception of what he considers good. That is the dangerous point. We, we as conservatives, libertarians, classical liberals, often find this abhorrent at the domestic level, do we not? The government's social engineering uh, it's society, in, in redistributing wealth, imposing regulations, telling people how to speak, how to live, what to, how, how to interact. And we object to this. We say, what is the government doing with the presumption and arrogance to plan people's lives within the United States? Should we not take that same critical presumption and ask, what is the United States government doing, planning, intervening, attempting to remold, remake, tell people how to live, act, and believe? You know, th there's always things in the world that we as individuals don't like. This is, a, this is the circumstance. And some are just, well, we just don't like it. And sometimes we see people doing harmful things to themselves. But the problem is there is no cure to this other than reason, persuasion, and the examples of our own lives. That's how we help others who we care about at home. The same thing applies, such as John Quincy Adams, who you quoted, when he said America does not go abroad to fight foreign monsters. He didn't say that America should not try to be uh, uh, an element for good in the world, but he believed that America's greatest element for good was to practice freedom at home and exemplify what a free society could be like. Liberty, peacefulness, prosperity, rule of law, tolerance. And out of this could be an image, a vision that others would want to emulate and to try to achieve in their own lands, with their own efforts, rather than expecting America to violate its principles to try to set their lands right at the cost of abridging liberties and the principles of America at home. Yeah, your, your point about Trump is very interesting because, as you know, he campaigned uh, not as a non-interventionist, but 
He was questioning these foreign wars. He was questioning the disastrous consequences of them. He was questioning NATO. Uh, I think it's the reason why some libertarians got excited about Trump, decided to back his candidacy. Um, certainly, he, he raised the hopes of many non-interventionists thinking, hey, he's, he's okay, he's not going to bring all the troops home from everywhere, but he's going to bring them away from these uh, forever wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, maybe the Middle East, generally Syria. The guy's just totally turned. He gets into office and he's uh, essentially been absorbed into the national security establishment, uh, the, the Pentagon, the CIA, the NSA. I mean, he's essentially just become part of them. Uh, w with respect to these forever wars. But it, as, as you and I have long maintained, Richard, it, it's really not so much a person problem. Oh, let's get better people in public office. It's a system problem. That, that if you've got a bad system, the probability is you're going to attract the kind of people that, that favor all this kind of junk. And that what we really need to be thinking in terms of change is changing the paradigm, changing the structure. Uh, now, what does that mean with respect to foreign policy? It means that, you know, we don't want to, you know, have selective interventionism. Uh, you know, I've often heard it said that, oh, well, we ought to intervene only when it's in our interest. Well, then there's no limitation at all, because I can guarantee you every intervention, Iraq, Afghanistan, Korea, Vietnam, uh, World War I, World War II, all, you know, Grenada, Panama, every single one. The, the person calling for the intervention believed that it was in America's interest to do so. Mm -hmm. So we really need to be thinking in terms of an entirely different system. And that system is was really the founding system of America, a system of non-intervention. You, you just don't intervene in the affairs of other countries. You, you may say, well, we don't like that dictator in Cuba. Okay. We don't like the fact that he's a communist. Okay. We don't like the fact that he's oppressive, okay? But that doesn't mean that the U.S. government should be trying to assassinate him, imposing an embargo on, on the Cuban people, uh, and doing all other kind of things to be meddling. And, you know, it's often said, oh, well, you know, America needs to spread democracy in the world. Really? Why? Uh, and, and not only that, but there's a huge element of, of hypocrisy here, because while the... the the democracy spreading rationale was used, uh, for example, to invade Iraq. You've got other instances where the U.S. hates democracy. Uh, they, they hated it in Chile when they, they incited a coup there that installed a military dictator into power, a brutal military dictator. They proceeded to kill and rape and execute and torture t uh, thousands of people. And then you've got, you know, the Guatemalan incident where they... Where they uh, ousted the democratically elected president because they didn't like him and installed a military dictatorship. We got Iran in 53. So you got, you got a lot of hypocrisy that comes with this foreign policy of interventionism, uh, along with the disastrous consequences. I mean, look what kind of dysfunctional society we're living in now. I mean, where you've got massive surveillance and FISA courts, secret courts operating, you know, in secret You've got, um, you know, s secret surveillance. And, and what is all this for? It's to protect us from the enemies that their foreign policy produces. You know, because they're saying, oh, the terrorists are coming to get us. Uh, well, why are there terrorists? You know, well, because they're over there with their interventionist foreign policies in the Middle East, Afghanistan, Libya, Iraq. Uh, you've got the massive refugee crises these things have produced. Uh, so it's really time to bring it to an end, Richard. I mean, there, you know, we've got 15-year anniversary now with with, with uh, Iraq, uh, the invasion of Iraq, and look what look what it has done in that country. It wasn't a mistake to invade Iraq, as as they often say. It was a crime. It was a criminal offense. There was no legitimate authority to invade a country for the purpose of regime change. Now we often also hear that, oh well, you, you guys are isolationists. What does that mean? I mean, because we want to bring the troops home. We don't want them to be engaged in these forever wars. We're not the ones calling for the building of walls. We're not the ones calling for visa restrictions and immigration control that isolates America, oh, and protective tariffs that isolate America from the world. We're the ones that are calling for free trade, for interactions with the people of the world. But what, what the difference is here with these two paradigms 
is that the interventionist says, unleash the U.S. government across the world. Let it stomp on, on all these monsters around the world and isolate the private sector with, you know, visa restrictions, immigration controls, protective tariffs, walls. We say the exact opposite. We say bring back the troops, you know, leash in the, the federal government, limited government, and then unleash the private sector. Leave the American people free to interact with the people of the world. Get rid of the sanctions, the embargoes, the travel restrictions, and all the rest. This is the key. If you want a free, prosperous, harmonious, uh, moral-based society, this is the key. That all you got to do is adopt a policy, of a system of non-interventionism, and then liberate the private sector to inter interact with the people of the world. Yes, yeah, so if I can just elaborate on one complementary theme of what you've just said. Uh, many people say, but, but there are bad things going on in the world by bad people. Do we have no responsibility, sense of obligation as human beings to help those who are brutalized, terrorized, threatened by tyrants and war? Certainly. The same way as a human being, I feel an obligation to assist someone who I think is following a bad path in their life, maybe drug addiction or, or, or other temptations that can be harmful to themselves. But as an advocate of liberty, I consider myself bound to only use reason, persuasion, and the example of my own life to assist them. I do not believe I have a right to use the power of the state to make them to conform to a way of living or a form of action that is, they are not ready to live on their own. Liberty means that people have a right to their own mistakes. How does that relate to foreign policy? Any private individual or group of private individuals are at liberty in a free society to go abroad to help others. Financial support to a cause that they believe in, to volunteer, to go fight on, on the side of a cause for pay, but they cannot expect the government to use the tax revenues of the citizenry as the whole and take America into harm's way as a nation as a whole because of a cause that they as private individuals believe in because invariably there are other Americans who do not share their view and then are forced to pay for foreign interventions and causes taken, taken a, 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 a upon by the US government that they do not share. That too is a forced redistribution of wealth. Now, what about it? What do you mean private assistance? Well, if I can just give two examples quickly. In the 19th century, there were revolts against Spanish rule in South America. A leading advocate of the freedom movements there was Simon Bolivar. He attracted Americans, that is, citizens of the United States, to come down there and participate uh, as, as, uh, as members of these revolutions to establish freedom against Spanish rule. Now, some were adventurers. Oh, the excitement of it. Other Americans were idealists, helping others to be free just as we fought our revolution against the British. And others went to for pay, right? And they, to, to use the what is viewed as derogatory word, mercenaries. But they went there. In some places, there are statues to them. The other instance of this and this is a case of people who were guided by their ideology from the political left during the Spanish Civil War from 1936 to 1939. Francisco Franco and his fascist forces, with the support of Mussolini and Hitler, undertook a rebellion, an attempt to seize the country, which tragically did succeed after a three-year civil war. But there were many Americans who felt ideologically, philosophically, personally, appalled by this fascist grab of Spain. And so they went, mostly leftists, socialists, communists, or just in the American meaning of liberals, and they volunteered. They fought in things called the Abraham Lincoln Brigade, the George Washington Brigade, and assisted the Republican side in the Spanish Civil War and for their cause. They did it at their own expense, risking and sometimes losing their own lives, to my, my estimation, I may not agree with their wider ideology of, of the left, but as individuals, they did what they thought was moral, and they did not try to drag their friends in their own neighborhoods to go fight against their will. 
they chose as individuals in a free country to go and fight for the cause they believed in. That is how all Americans have the opportunity or should have the opportunity to act if they have a conscience to feel that there's an oppression abroad or a country being unjustly invaded by a neighbor and they feel compelled as human being to in some way, shape or form give assistance to those who they viewed as oppressed or threatened. But there is nothing consistent with a system of liberty in which you can expect to have all Americans to support your foreign intervention any more than it is right to expect Americans at home to fund domestic programs that they don't agree with merely because you think they're good. Yeah, that's a great point. And, you know, the flip side of it is, is, the, is that those, many of those who call for interventionism are the last ones that ever want to go and volunteer to, to help out the people that, that are being oppressed. And what they, when they say, well, we need to go help the people of South Vietnam, we need to do this. <coughs> uh, what you know, the pronoun we means is the troops, the U.S. troops need to go do that. And when you say, well, are you willing to go yourself? Oh, no, 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 no. That's my job. I need to sit home and write, write op-eds and I work for a newspaper or a radio station. I, I, I can't be bothered with such a thing. And uh, it's always, oh, send someone else. And Richard, you know, sometimes people ask me, well, what's your model for this foreign policy? Well, the model is the United States uh, in the, for the first hundred years of its existence. But a modern day model for me is Switzerland. I mean, you know, there are things about Switzerland I don't agree with, a conscription, for example. But when they have a Department of Defense, and I don't know if they call it that or not, it really is defense. I mean, you know, the Department of Defense that we have really isn't defense. It's a lie. It's a Department of Empire and Interventionism. The, the, notice that the Swiss government doesn't have troops stationed in any other country. They don't intervene in Iraq. They don't, they don't intervene in Afghanistan. The, the Swiss people are not pacing the floor over the latest terrorist attack. Why? Because they're not the, the target of terrorist attacks. Why? Because their government isn't intervening. Instead, their government is limited to defending Switzerland. And believe me, nobody ever wants to jack with the Swiss because they are the absolute experts on self-defense, on defense of their country. You know, practically every family's armed. They know where to go in, in, in case of an emergency, an invasion of their country. And in other words, the government minds its own business. It doesn't butt into the affairs of nations all over the world unlike the U.S. government, which really is the, the world's, as you said in the beginning, global policeman, interloper, intervener, Budinsky, uh, and of course, it's we, the American people, who are bearing the price for this. Not only an out-of-control federal spending and debt, but the loss of our liberty here at home. That's the consequence of foreign interventionism. We lose our liberty and prosperity here at home. Now, so, I, I, yeah, I, go ahead. I, I just it, uh, makes one slight correction. There are Swiss who serve in foreign lands. They're called the Swiss guards <laughs> at the Vatican. But these are private individuals who choose and have for centuries now to serve as guards in the Vatican. Free mercenaries uh, contracted for. That's a model for us all. <laughs> <laughs> April 29th. Charleston, South Carolina, 1 to 5 p.m. Sunday afternoon at the uh, Mills House Wyndham Grand Hotel. Uh, fantastic opportunity for you to visit one of the most beautiful cities in the country, Charleston, South Carolina. Ron Paul is going to be heading the, the speaker lineup. This is your chance to, to meet Ron if you've never met him. Uh, uh, your chance to hear a fantastic speech. Every speech I've ever heard Ron Paul give is absolutely, you know, captivating. And you get to hear Richard Ebeling, uh, the professor of economics there at the Citadel, uh, Dan McAdams, who runs the Ron Paul Institute, and myself, who will be also giving a talk. So we love to have you. We, we hope that you'll advise your email list, your friends, your relatives uh, about the event, not only just those in Charleston, but everywhere else, because like I say, this is your chance to visit one of the finest uh, cities in the country. Uh, come in Friday, tour the city Friday and Saturday, Sunday morning, and then come to what I think is going to be a fantastic conference. Uh, I Richard? Would say, I would just add as a compliment to this, is our book that you and I edited and contributed many of the chapters to 
the failure of America's foreign wars, uh, still worth uh, reading, relevant, and easily accessible at a quite reasonable price. Yeah, we published that book way back when, you know, what, in the 90s or so, but it's timeless. I mean, it, 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 all the principles there apply just as much today as when we, when we wrote the, the original articles. Richard, greatly enjoyed the show and looking forward to seeing you next month in Charleston, South Carolina. Absolutely. And next week for L.A. Next week for what? L.A. You mean Libertarian right Angle? Yes, yeah. right here for Libertarian <laughs> Angle next week. I thought I thought we had a conference in Los Angeles that you hadn't told me about. Well, I, I, you mean we don't? <laughs> okay, yes. Next week's Libertarian Angle, or L.A. as you put it. And I uh, look forward to seeing you, and thank you all for tuning in. We hope to see you in Charleston. Take care. Bye-bye.